Hello, everyone. Welcome to UserList. Our awesome guest today is Patrick Thompson, Director of Product at Amplitude. Hey, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, how's it going? Uh, we're very excited to learn from you today. And the topic is viral loops. Very fascinating for anybody who does product, right? I mean, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in your old days at Atlassian, I imagine you've come across viral loops a lot. That's uh, the foundation of your talk, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. When I was uh, at Atlassian, I spent about six months just thinking about virality, and it was probably one of the most exciting parts of my four years at Atlassian, uh, which is just how do we increase our customer base and provide them more value and get them to invite more people into our products. And it was a definitely a fascinating learning exercise for me and uh, excited to share some of that knowledge with folks here today. Fantastic. A uh, few housekeeping notes. We do have a sidebar with questions. So if you have any questions, we're going to have a Q&A after the workshop. So welcome to drop in yours. And now, Patrick, the stage is all yours. Well, cool. Let me share my screen. And I'm definitely excited to share uh, some of the content that we put together today and looking forward to the Q&A section at the end. So yeah, ask away at the end. We're, we'll definitely be excited to walk through uh, any of the questions that folks have today. Cool. So you should all be see seeing my screen now. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Cool. So as, uh, as Jane mentioned, my name is Patrick Thompson. I am currently the director of product at Amplitude, focusing on our data management offering there. But previously, I was the co-founder of Iteratively, uh, which Amplitude acquired about a year ago. And before that, worked for four years at Alassian. Uh, primarily two years on growth there, and then two years as a design manager for Jira Software. Uh, definitely had a great experience there, and hopefully excited to share some of what we learned and uncovered as far as some of the experiments that we ran, and some of kind of the, the maxims that hopefully some of you will be able to take back to your company, be able to build into your product experience as well. Um, so what we'll cover today is what is a viral loop. When we talk about viral loops, you might hear this comment or topic uh, on other places, but we'll kind of just cover what a viral loop is, the four most common types of viral loops, uh, and then kind of the steps needed to bake virality into your product like a good chef. And then we'll share some lessons learned along the way with some of the mistakes that we made uh, so that you can avoid them uh, for your teams as well. Um, but first, what is virality? Uh, virality occurs in a product when one user helps acquire another user. That's the best way, the most simplest way in my mind to be able to, to articulate it. There are many ways you can grow your product, but when you use right, virality can have kind of a huge impact on accelerating the growth of your business and lowering your customer acquisition costs. This is one of the areas that you can obviously invest in. You get compounding growth and returns over time as well. Uh, most folks think virality is magic. It's not. You can definitely engineer it at the end of the day. Uh, this is where viral loops come into play. Uh, viral loops are a key part of your growth model as a business and help you systematically measure the steps users take in your product to acquire another user. Defining and measuring your growth loops is one of the first steps that we'll talk about when it comes to uh, thinking about virality for your product and your team. Once you've defined kind of the inputs and outputs of your growth loops, it becomes easier to optimize and then make strategic investment decisions on areas of investment. So what are the four most common types of viral loops? The first is word of mouth, when one person tells another about your product. Uh, the second is indirect, when a user indirectly exposes other users to your product while using it. Uh, the third is incentivized, when users are directly rewarded for inviting others to your product. And the last is organic, when a user invites others as part of experiencing your product's core value. And all of these things can be kind of intertwined together. You can definitely kind of stack these uh, viral loops or vi viral experiments on top of each other to kind of achieve uh, oversized returns as well. I honestly thought that we mean organic by viral loops. Like I, I didn't even think about the other three before. 
<laughs> yeah, everyone, I mean, organic is the one that a lot of people I think focus on. And I'll walk through some examples of all four of these to help make them a little bit more concrete to folks. I think word of mouth is the one that I think we spent the most time thinking about as a company at uh, Alassian. And uh, I'll talk a little bit why that was. But we, we experimented with all four of these at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, organic is definitely, I feel like, the one that folks mostly think about when they think about virality and how to improve just the organic virality within your core product experience. And obviously, that is what we see from a lot of companies like Slack and Notion and um, Alassian as well. So let me jump into kind of what word of mouth is and why this was important for us at Alassian. Uh, the primary driver for word of mouth at the end of the day is building a great product. <laughs> it's the hardest to engineer and only works if you're solving real customer uh, pain. Uh, then folks will naturally be more incentivized to sing your praises. Uh, for Lassie and Jay Simons kind of articulated the best, the flywheel begins uh, with creating a great product. Back in the early days of Alassian, we talked about building a remarkable product. We choose the word remarkable with intention. We wanted to build a product that people felt compelled to remark upon. That would then build word of mouth, which would help us acquire more customers. So when we thought about even kind of our entire market, and Jay Simons was the president of Alassian for you know 10 plus years. When we thought about kind of our entire brand, our marketing uh, and our product strategy, it was really around kind of building an excellent experience. And you, you can definitely see that in the way that Alassian has uh, focused on spend from sales and marketing versus product development. They spend way more heavy in product development than they do for any company of their size at this point. And you can see that kind of, uh, again, going back into the fact that we wanted our product to be one of our primary acquisition levers because we wanted to build a product that people would remark on, therefore acquire more customers versus just spending money more traditionally in sales and marketing. Um, and so, yeah, this was definitely key to kind of our strategy of success at Alassian long term for being able to kind of build out that compounding growth. Um, cool. And then when we think about indirect, indirect viral loops occur when users who are using a product uh, indirectly expose other non-users to the product. This is an example of status page, which was a, a lasting acquisition uh, as well. And in the case of status page, one of the primary early, early drivers of growth for them was the powered by status page link in the footer of their product. Users would view a status page from another company uh, and they would then decide to sign up or create one on their own. And they could get started in you know, less than 10, 10 minutes and getting their own status page up and running. And this was uh, primarily the, the number one driver for growth for the status page team, both pre-acquisition as well as post-acquisition. Uh, just the powered by status page, it was the simplest probably way to, to get net new customers for them. And then you can kind of see this pattern emerge in a lot of other companies out there today. Um, for them, this was pretty novel at the time in the early uh, 20, <laughs> 2010s. Um, but now, obviously, this is definitely a playbook that a lot of people run. And similar to most growth experiments as well, you can see some of these things will start to degrade over time and effectiveness. And so the new patterns will end up emerging. But this was definitely kind of a, a pattern that has caught on by a lot of organizations to kind of increase the overall indirect virality of their product. Uh, and it's pretty simple when it comes to the level of effort it takes to think about this. If your product has a, a naturally a shareable uh, function that you might want to be able to, to build on top of. We can look at kind of how this works from a, a growth loop perspective. I think one of the things I want to take away for folks to take away today is that when we think about virality, there is definitely loops inside of your product experience. Um, so when you can think of status page as an example, uh, you can see that a public page, users create a public status page for their company. Uh, there's page view, uh, how many viewers view the status page. There's a click through rate, the percent of viewers who click on powered by the status page. And then there are new users, the percent of people who click on Powered By and become a new user here. So we can kind of see this entire growth loop, uh, essentially, of folks who get exposed to another company's status page, view uh, the status page, sign up form, uh, click through, and essentially become a net new customer for a status page. And so one of the things that's super important when you think about these viral loops is actually instrumenting them and measuring the effectiveness within your own um, growth model as a company. 
So getting a tool like Amplitude or Mixpanel or whatever other analytics solution that you want to use, uh, making sure that you're measuring this and understanding whether or not you're improving uh, or, or regressing when it comes to your own viral uh, initiatives. Cool. And when we look at like different indirect examples that companies have done over time, there's a there's a there's quite a few. You can see uh, Delighted, which has the powered by inside of their emails for for the NPS email that they send out. Um, you can see that HubSpot has it uh, right away. Add free live chat to your site directly inside of the HubSpot widget that you embed. Same thing with Olivio, powered by Olivio, and then Heap used to. Uh, I think they still might actually have this like interesting uh indirect viral loop where they would incentivize people to actually uh, add a badge to their website which gives them twenty thousand free sessions per month and so this is an example of a single-sided incentive uh model where uh, as a customer i'm incentivized to add a badge to my website that has the heap branding and logo uh effectively helping heap uh, acquire more customers from that essentially add placement on your own product experience. So this is a great way to think about the different options that you can have. You can think about kind of the low audacious options to the extremely audacious options, which is what more of the direction that he went. Um, we'll talk a little bit about incentivized referrals. So I think Dropbox here is probably the most famous example. If you can think about their their growth team and what they were and it ended up uh, effectively able to grow the business through kind of this incentivized growth loop. Uh, they increased signups with a referral program by 60%. Um, and I think probably a lot of folks on this call, if you've ever used Dropbox, I definitely remember in college trying to hack this system to get as much free storage as I possibly could, because I didn't want to pay for anything because I was a poor college student. Um, but effectively, this definitely helped them get more customers, which ultimately ended up converting from you know, college students all the way to paid professionals long term. Um, so in the case of Dropbox, for every friend you invite that joins, you'll get a gig of storage and they'll get 500 megabytes. So Dropbox, you know, again, famously increased their, their referral program by, by 60% through this kind of double-sided incentive model here, both the inviter as well as the invitee were incentivized to, to share this. Um, and this is probably, I think the, the quintessential example of how this works for incentivized models. I don't know, Jane, did you ever use the go through this Dropbox incentivized program? No, I think I upgraded. But among other in, uh, incentivized ones, I recall uh, MailChimp's badges um, yeah. as an example. They have some sort of, we used to have, I'm not sure, monetization through displaying a badge in your email footer. Yeah, I think there's a lot of companies that even have that where if there's no incentive essentially for the participant, but it's like on by default. And so like with MailChimp, I don't know if that was incentivized or non-incentivized, but there's been definitely a lot of products. I think uh, Stripe or Stripe is an example, interesting example of this. I think uh, Shopify is an interesting example of this where either you then upgrade to a paid plan to remove their, their branding essentially, or you have to just disable it, but it's enabled by default. And so a lot of folks just happen not to <laughs> disable it, which then be, again becomes a great viral loop for, for those organizations. So there's things that you can think of where, you know, you can either use it as a gate from a, a branding perspective to get, or, you know, get customers or organizations to convert to a paid plan to remove the co-branding or as a way to incentivize people to, to share by giving them an offer um or discount on your core product as well um yeah and you can think of dropbox here uh, it's a very simple loop you know as users use the product more they upload files then hit their storage limit they then can invite their friends to join Bro dropbox to get storage credit i think the one nice thing about here is there was kind of an or there was definitely a a inflection point so when i would hit my storage limit i'd want to invite my friends to join right because that would give me more storage for free and i didn't have to upgrade to pay for dropbox eventually i ended up paying still pay to this day uh 10 plus years later um and you know a percent of friends view the invitation and click through and a percent of those accept the invite and convert to a new user getting uh 500 megabytes of storage credit um, the nice thing about this loop is as users continue to use Dropbox, they'll hit their storage limit again and again, causing them to continue to share Dropbox 
to increase their storage or upgrade to a paid account. So either way, it's a, it's a net win for Dropbox. If you think about the customer acquisition costs for them to acquire a new customer, getting your existing customer base to acquire those customers for you is much, much cheaper. Therefore, it helps pay for the additional storage that you're offering them. There is a fun uh, thing to say about this. Um, you can safeguard such promotions uh, so that people can't hack them. But if you don't and they can hack them, that can lead to viral marketing when people say, oh, here's an article how you can hack Dropbox and there's a backlink and people's attention. So it's it's good both ways. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's it's always funny, like you can always have hard enforcements or soft enforcements. And I think having soft enforcements in product, even when it comes to feature gating is always an interesting thing because you can learn more just looking at the analytics as well. Yep. Not how customers are, are circumventing some of the programs that you put in place. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, if we look at kind of the, the overall incentive structure, you can see that this is very popular, both within kind of the FinTech and media space as well. We're looking just here at FinTech. Uh, you can see Robinhood uh, spices things up by giving you kind of additional elements of surprise and a variable award by randomizing what stock you'll get. So instead of just giving you storage and you know exactly what you're getting with uh, with Robinhood, you get a surprise. It's a, you don't know what stock you're going <laughs> to get. It could be a, an Apple stock. It could be which was worth you know, hundreds of dollars at the time or something a lot less valuable. Um, so you get the sense of variable reward and surprise and delight in this experience, which um, is definitely very, very, uh, I don't know. For me, it's a lot more enticing. You kind of get that compelling urge to want to participate. Um, my favorite example of a reward is kind of Yelp's Elite Squad, which was for content loops, which rewarded community members with exclusive events for writing high quality reviews. Uh, this would be indexed by search engines, subsequently bringing in new users to the product. So this wasn't exactly kind of a, this is more of like a, a content <laughs> incentivized growth loop at the end of the day, where Yelp folks would write great reviews. Those reviews would be indexed. People would search for reviews around that, that company or organization. They'd find the reviews from Yelp, uh, and then they would join, end up joining Yelp. So it was another in a incentivized model, but it wasn't a online incentive. It was an offline incentive to be able to go join kind of these exclusive events. Um, and that, yeah, just kind of connect your community at the end of the day. Um, so when you think about kind of incentivized models, you can, there's definitely a lot of different approaches to this. Obviously what I'm showing you here with Coinbase, TransferWise, Uber, Robinhood, and Wealthfront is kind of very much the traditional incentivized structure here. But yeah, I definitely would encourage people to think a little bit more out of the box. It doesn't have to be monetary. It could be this notion of exclusivity. It could be this notion of connecting with the founders or being part of the customer advisory board. However you want to think about it, there's different ways to build in this kind of uh, notion of incentivized growth loops into your, your business at the end of the day. And it scales depending on whether or not you're a B2C organization or a B2B organization. Um, when we look at kind of incentivized things that we did at Alassian in particular, this is a, I'll walk through some of the experiments that we actually ran. We tried everything from giving away t-shirts, uh, AWS credit, trial extensions, you name it. Uh, in some cases, um, the incentive can be as simple as a user sharing an achievement they've accomplished. So here we're not really giving the user anything of monetary value, but we're kind of allowing them to kind of build their own prestige or brand here. So this is an example within HipChat where, you know, we would just send these random messages in product when users were able to hit these kind of milestones. So we were trying to add elements of gamification to the experience, and then they can kind of share their status out to the world. And you can see in this context, Nathan, I just sent my 3900 hip chat message for those who remember hip chat. <laughs> How many messages have you sent? And so this was an example of us building in these kind of touch points inside of our product experience where our customers would then engage with. Uh, and then obviously the, the whole notion was here to, was to build brand equity as well as to get customers back into the hip chat um, at the time. And everything was kind of tagged with UTM parameters. So it was very easy for us to measure the effectiveness of these uh, experiments as well. Um, when you think about organic, uh, viral loops, again, this, Jan, this was probably the one that you thought of probably by default when we talk about viral loops. I think this is the one that is obviously the, it could be the hardest to, to do at the end of the day, depending on, uh, you know, effort versus impact. 
So when we think about building in these organic loops into our product, you know, we have to make sure that we're providing value to the user at the end of the day and that our product is kind of fulfilling its product promise. The most common example are applications that facilitate collaboration. They tend to have the best organic viral loops. In the case of Jira software, there's almost always a team collaborating uh, on a project. So with Jira being almost an 18 year old, uh, I think at this point, almost 20 year old product and starting out as kind of a self-hosted product that was on prem that required a, a, essentially a lot of rework when we moved it to the cloud uh, to make it inherently viral. It was definitely not designed to be a SaaS application in the, in the early days. We had to start making it configurable so that anyone can invite users to their site. So instead of an IT admin or somebody sitting in the IT department who is managing this, essentially inviting users as they're onboarded to the organization, we wanted to open up the experience to make it easy for anybody to invite both users inside of your organization as well as outside of your organization if you're working with contractors or marketers or other folks, uh, not just your, your software development team. Um, so we started allowing folks to share invite URLs, create things like domain restricted signup. Um, yeah, and the, you know, when we added domain enabled signup so that anyone could, you know, from an approved domain could join, this was kind of a massive lift and effort for us as an organization. We had to kind of rebuild our entire authentication system, uh, our entire user management system as well. So we're talking, you know, uh, you know, multiple quarters of work in order to do this essentially but had a massive impact at the end of the day of being able to give us a good foundation where you weren't dependent upon your IT admin or an administrator of uh, the Elastian suite to be able to invite users. It can be can kind of configured. You can open up restrictions and just allow any uh, anybody inside your organization to invite other users into your product. These days, I feel like this is probably more table stakes for most orgs that are starting in the last, you know, let's just assume five years here, but definitely back 10 years ago, uh, user permissioning, uh, user access controls was definitely not thought of as a core growth lever for organizations, but you can definitely think about the way that users invite users into your organization, how they manage user access. Uh, when you think about things like not just inviting a user, but inviting a domain uh, as part of your invite flow that would enable anybody from that domain to sign up, that is definitely kind of a, another level of uh, thought that needs to go into that. You know, I would think you'd go super creative. I did not expect to see just removing sign-up friction to be the <laughs> driving lever of virality here, like by no means. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't know if I have an example of this as well, but like it's not just even, it, it, like we experimented probably, I probably did like half a dozen experiments just on the invite recipient email. <laughs> The email that the recipient gets when somebody invites them into an organization, we tested so many mm -hmm. different things. We tested showing the inviter name, showing the inviter avatar, the w structure of the email, the design and layout of that email. Just like one simple thing like the invite user or the invite recipient email, uh, we were able to improve like organic sign up uh, significantly <laughs> just from changing the content, the subject, uh, uh, the subject of the email as well to be a lot more personal from who invited you when they invited you and like allowing that recipient to actually customize the invite message as well. So it looked less spammy. Um, and that was definitely a huge boost on kind of our organic viral loop. And all we did was change an email. So when you think about your experience, I think it really is helpful to kind of map it out, figure out where the low hanging fruit is and then experiment with this. This was obviously more systematic of us putting a new uh, user management system in place. But there's definitely a lot of low hanging fruit when you think about just viral loops. Um, yeah, and then we think uh, one of the experiments that we ran was to add invite your team to the onboarding flow. Uh, previously, a user could only invite their team after they set up their first project in Jira. Uh, we ended up switching the permission model of projects to be open by default instead front loaded this step as part of the onboarding flow. You can see this in a lot of applications these days, like Slack, Notion, you name it. Um, but just making sure that companies were onboarding so that not, you know, in this example, not a particular user was onboarding and setting up Jira, but you're onboarding as a team to Jira and that effectively multiple people could help with the onboarding workload and the setup process. 
This improved the number of invited and active users at the end of a trial, which meant that we had a higher propensity to get customers to convert uh, from their trial to a paid account. So front loading the invite, making it easy for other folks to uh, join. So here you can see, let anyone invite other people to join your Jira site. Uh, by default, because this was kind of a breaking change in the way that we're handling permissioning, we had this disabled, but over time, this was enabled by default as well. So the original, you know, the original flow was register, use product, evaluate product, invite team. The variation that we tested was register, invite team, use product, and evaluate product together. <laughs> that improved uh, our our you know trial to activated customer uh, significantly. That is a brilliant idea. We talk a lot about onboarding teams, but I've never thought about the matter of order. That's really awesome. I'm yeah, these are a screenshot. I'm, <laughs> yeah, these are. I mean, these are simple things, right? It's like you know, this was probably, uh, you know, this probably took us like a month uh, to actually ship and get the experiment out the door to the the level of us productizing it post release as well. But like, I would think about like, what are all the different simple things that you can do to your onboarding flow uh, that help improve virality, help get other people onboarded? You know, as an example, in the context of of user list, right? You know, do you need to invite your developer to kind of help configure and set up your your ESP at the end of the day, or do you need to uh, invite your your marketing team? But making it very specific to what is the value that each individual role is getting as you invite them, and what is that their lining experience based off their role is super helpful because then like, you can personalize the content, you can personalize their lifecycle campaigns if you have them running as well to that particular user, and all you're doing is asking the first person who uh, essentially signs up for your products to give you a little bit more information and you can make everybody's lives a little bit better. Um, you know, we, we definitely <laughs> needed to improve uh, just the way, like, you know, this, this looks super basic at the end of the day, but this was a, a long, hard fought battle to get this out the door. Essentially, we had another experiment which was aimed at decreasing friction for allowing users to be able to invite directly from their project. Previously, users could only invite from within site administration, which was tedious and painful. If anyone's ever used Jira before, and you've probably been into the guts of Jira and site admin, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the easiest thing at the end of the day to, to navigate gate to or to figure out how to invite users. But essentially, being able to one-click invite users from a particular project board. So if you had a Kanban board and you wanted to invite another developer or another teammate to your board, this was essentially just removing uh, what was kind of a process where you had to go to site admin and do it to be able to do, do it directly from within your project from without you having to switch contacts. This was a huge amount of effort at the end of the day to do, um, but effectively was um, yeah just a, a great experience for the customer and, and did improve uh, the amount of users who were invited into the organization as well as the uh, the time to get the user into the organization as well. So make, removing friction, you can either think about removing friction or adding friction in the context, most of the things that I'm showing you are removing friction uh, to drive kind of this uh, uh, organic viral loops. Um, now, if I, you know, this is, a, this is another version of this at the end of the day. So when you think about inviting users, right? Like a lot of folks might think, okay, well, yeah, it makes sense. I need to invite a user into a project in order to collaborate with them. But a lot of the times you just want to share the content that's within the project. So it's a different mental model at the end of the day of like whether or not I'm inviting somebody into a project or whether or not I'm just sharing an issue with somebody. Uh, ultimately, we, we create a user <laughs> for, for that particular person. But switching the, the mental model or the, the construct around how you know, customers are inviting folks into your, into your product is definitely helpful. So similar to the previous experiment, we wanted to decrease the friction for sharing content to users that didn't have an account. So previously, this was impossible. <laughs> Let's just be clear. There's no way to do this inside of Jira. You'd first have to add the user, wait for them to join, and then share the content with them. Um, obviously, that's a lot of friction. And you know, it takes many, you could take a week for a user to join. They might be on vacation. And then you have to, you don't get a notification when they join. So then you have to then go remember to share uh share the content with them afterwards so this experiment made it possible to share the content directly kicking off an invite flow uh the invitee would then be able to see what was shared with them increasing the likelihood of them clicking through so again this is just 
you know, customizing that recipient email to say, hey, Patrick Thompson invited you to, uh, you know, this particular Jira ID with a, the subject line inside of the email. So then I would click through, sign up for my Jira account with this organization, and then I could see the content. So it was a personalized flow, but just making it easier for folks to invite folks based off the content increased the level of personalization that we were able to provide when it came to that email and then provide and then landed the user in the right spot in the product uh, at the end of the day as well. So again, this is all around, if you think about this, this is all around just building a great product experience, uh, but we're, we're measuring the uh, impact that we're having as we're changing as we go. Um, yeah, so if we can kind of simplify this loop down into something like this, user creates content that they want to share, user shares the content with their teammates, inviting them to join a site, a percent of teammates view the invitation and click through, a percent of those become active users. Our kind of North Star metric at the end of the day was monthly active users at Atlassian. We wanted to get as many monthly active users as we can. So again, virality was kind of one of the key levers that we had. And so this loop was particularly high frequency as users are constantly sharing content with folks inside and outside their organization who may or may not have a account yet on Jira. Um, and that was also kind of our value metric at the end of the day is at Elastian, we would charge based off the number of users that you had inside of your organization. So this impact, this not just directly impacted monthly active usage, but also directly impacted revenue. Um, and you can think about, you know, inherent virality is kind of being adopted by some of the fastest growing products today. Uh, Notion allows you to share content publicly. They go one step further by allowing you to enable that content to be indexable by search engines, creating a content loop as well. Um, there's also, they also support domain enabled signup and guest access. So, you know, when you think about kind of building out your permission model at the end of the day for whatever startup or company you're working at. These are, I think, three of the main ways that I would think about it, just you know, baking essentially virality inherently into your, your flow. If you look at you know, companies like Slack, Slack has multiple touch points to increase exposure of the viral loops as well. So you can share an invite link for folks to be able to join your organization. You can add people or let others sign up from a verified domain as well. You can see that they have it as part of their onboarding flow as well as it's kind of always visible inside of their lower left sidebar if you've uh, used Slack before. Um, yeah, again, and you can you can think about whether who needs to be the one that invites flows. You know, you can say by default they were open. So they also support domain enabled sign up and allow anyone to invite others by default. They allow admins to be able to restrict this access. Uh, so if you are working in kind of a regulated industry or even more the context of B2B enterprise SaaS, you could still have things open by default, but then have kind of an admin flag to disable it. My guess is most people won't, which is great for your business. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, so running through this real quick, we obviously went through kind of a few examples of viral loops. Let's look at kind of the steps needed to bake virality into your product. Number one, uh, ho hopefully this is a, a solid takeaway for folks, build a great product. <laughs> First and foremost, uh, focus on making sure that your product is delivering value to your customers. If you don't have product market fit, users aren't going to retain and they'll just churn out your leaky bucket. Essentially, virality helps, but if you don't have product market fit, you're just putting a Band-Aid on something that's gonna fester. So make sure you're building a great product experience. Um, Step two, measure your baseline. For each viral loop you have, you'll want to measure each step so that you can see how it's performing and where to focus on to improve it. So you can create, build it, you know, the best way to do this in my mind is to build a dashboard in uh, Amplitude or track this in a spreadsheet. Um, one thing to keep in mind is the frequency at each step a user will participate. Um, the other thing is that compound or you know, viral loops compounds, you can think of kind of stacking these on top of each other. You can have viral loops kick off other viral loops at the end of the day. So again, try to design your, your, your overall growth model. You can do this in Miro or Figma or other tools, but think about your business as a model of inputs and outputs, uh, or the, the notion of kind of stacking these loops together. Um, and then it helps kind of provide you like, Hey, if I improve something over here, how does it impact this other aspect of the system downstream? Um, but yeah, definitely make sure you're measuring your baseline as you start experimenting. And then, you know, 
this also goes into kind of the, the whole measure your baseline. You'll want to measure your K factor as well. Uh, K factor is the output metric used to describe the growth rate of products. Uh, it's the sum of all the viral loops in your product. If you have a growth rate of greater than one, you have exponential growth, less than one exponential decline. <laughs> Obviously, we're all wanting to have exponential growth at the end of the day. Uh, so this is why it's super important to measure your growth loops. Again, they compound. You can stack them all up and kind of can measure your K factor, which is a, a huge kind of uh, measure of the health of your business, uh, depending on, you know, your business model. Um, and then step three is map out the customer journey. Um, journey mapping helps visualize how customers experience your product or service and how they feel along the way. Uh, this should be used in conjunction with real user research, you know, obviously talk to your customers. Um, this process will help identify, uh, the pain points along their journey which is useful for brainstorming and experimenting uh, ideas that you can test. So it helps you inform hypotheses that you can then go validate through research. Uh, some example questions you might want to answer through journey mapping. Uh, why would users want to invite more people? Uh, is this the right time to share what I'm working on with my team? Uh, do I need help completing this step? You know, again, these are common questions that you might uh, ask throughout an entire user experience or user journey map. Uh, and that will let you know whether or not there's a great spot within that journey to kind of help build in or bake in virality. Um, yeah, and again, to optimize an existing viral loop, you can either decrease friction by making it simpler for folks to invite others or increase desire by increasing the incentive. So uh, you can think of these as kind of a series of inputs and outputs. You either remove friction or you increase the uh, essentially the, the pile of gold on the other side of the hill. So either you lower the, the, the height of the hill or increase the pot of gold on the other side of it. Um, step four, brainstorm solutions. The next step once you have your journey map complete is to brainstorm experiment ideas. You can use crazy eights, uh, disruptive brainstorming, scamper, or any other design thinking exercises here. The goal here is to come up with loads of ideas and eventually call them down to your best. Uh, if you've never done this type of exercise before, I highly recommend it. Um, consider running this process as part of a design sprint with your team to help kind of add some structure. Um, the goal here is to essentially build as many ideas as you possibly can and then kind of just whittle it down. Um, you can think about this as kind of a double diamond approach if you're all familiar with that as well. Um, and then lastly, stack rank. Uh, so once you have your list of experiment ideas, again, you want to whittle it down to begin uh, building out kind of your experiment backlog. Your ideal experiment is something that has a big impact, is backed up by solid research and evidence, and requires minimal effort to build. I've had a lot of success uh, previously working in growth teams using, you know, ICE or RICE. You know, essentially, ICE stands for impact, confidence, and ease, and is used by giving each criteria a score of one to ten. Uh, with a one being the worst and a 10 being the best, you get the final ice score. You add up each score to get a number between three and 30. And that you and that can help you. You can use that to help prioritize your backlog, essentially. Uh, we actually built this into Chira. So it made it really easy for us to, to manage, uh, essentially, in a more formulaic process. Um, for impact, you know, being able to go back to kind of the qualitative model, uh, you know, basing this on kind of exposure rate, you know, increasing the participation rate, what is the expected net outcome? The way that I always think about this is the notion of probabilistic thinking. So if I was to move this particular part or this particular, you know, input in this formula by X percentage, what is the outcome that I would achieve? And is that outcome meaningful for the business? So before you go work on something, understand like, okay, what do I have to move as part of this uh, input? in order to have the expected output that I need? And is that percentage of movement that I'm going to have there realistic, not realistic? Uh, this notion of probabilistic thinking, I think, just helps avoid a lot of wasted work at the end of the day and make sure that you're working on the right problem or the right bet, essentially, for you and your team when you're prioritizing your experiment ideas or hypotheses. Um, yeah, confidence should represent how sure you are that the test will lead to an improvement. Um, and then ease represents how much time and effort will, it, you know, it will take to get the test up and running. An easier test would be scored higher as the faster you, you can get results and learn from your users, the better. Um, now that you have a prioritized backlog of experiment ideas, it's time to, to, to get started. Uh, so I'll cover some of the quick lessons uh, learned along the way as well. 
Um, one, no dark patterns, like try to avoid dark patterns. If you know what dark patterns are, don't use them. Um, yeah, the, the goal here is not to use deceptive design to get users to take actions. They don't want to take, you know, a common example of this was like Yahoo days where you have a lot of friends spam, like, Hey, like add your contact list. Or when you join, like, you know, give me permission to your contact list. I'm going to send everybody in your contact list a, a message. Yeah, don't do that. Um, the goal is to obviously provide value and not erode customer trust. Uh, yeah, and this is part of a process. So you want to lay the foundation. It took us years to get in a place to have organic bar loops at Elastin. It was a ton of work. Uh, it's important to map out your bar loops and your growth model, instrument your product so you can quantify each loop and capture a baseline, and then overall get team buy-in. <laughs> I think that's you know change management and organizational friction are typically the the largest uh hurdles that teams have to go uh overcome um so yeah just don't jump in without getting uh folks on board with what you're doing but again it takes it takes many many months if not years to kind of lay the foundation uh stack loops again i think i mentioned this a few times but loops compound and they can you can stack them uh as well so this is super important. You can see in the context of superhuman, they obviously had word of mouth plus an indirect viral loop that kind of helped drive awareness and essentially generate a wait list of over 180K uh, folks who, who wanted access to this. So you can definitely uh, stack them and they do compound over time. Um, yeah, this is just an example from Trello where you can see that they had incentivized plus organic viral loops and they kind of built their own gamification system in place as well called Trello Gold. And that is it for me. So I think we have about 40 or 20 minutes left for questions. Hopefully this was helpful for folks and excited to, to kick it off. This is great. Thanks so much, Patrick. It really took a different direction from what I thought. It's more about fine tuning the most boring processes in the world <laughs> a lot of times versus you know creatively imagining something and implementing that or maybe a mix. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I think there's always the the notion of like, there's always a lot of iteration or fine tuning in any process that you have at the end of the day. Um, and yeah, part of the goal is obviously to fine tune the experience, but part of it's also like essentially net new bets that you have to go prioritize. And there's a lot of work when it comes to building a foundation that can essentially let virality thrive. So I think that was one of the things I wanted to, to take away is like, it's not, it's, you know, it's not a magic wand that you can wave and bake in virality in a matter of weeks or months. Like there's a, essentially you do have to go lay the foundation for it to thrive. And uh, it's not always an easy task depending on your organization. I've got a few questions for you. So number one is who is typically doing such product experiments? Because it's not that these little features are specifically on on the core product functionality right we're talking about enhancements on the periphery so how do you get team buy-in and who is actually responsible for all of this yeah it's a great question so in the context of elastin we had a growth team and the way that we delineated the work at a very high level was that the product organization was responsible for creating the value the growth team was responsible for connecting customers or users to that value at the end of the day mm -hmm. so uh, growth teams think differently traditionally than product organizations, and there's inherent friction a lot of the times between these two organizations. But it was the growth team's mandate to essentially go drive virality. Um, so we had uh, what we called kind of like our company-wide uh, objectives, and one of those was around virality. So a very clear charter of what we needed to go do as a growth team. When it came to getting buy-in from the product organization, there wasn't a ton of inherent resistance at you know, at least when it came to some of the experiments that we wanted to ship. But what it meant that we had to do as a growth team is go work with the core platform teams to make sure that the platform was in a place <laughs> to allow virality to exist. And essentially that meant that we weren't shipping experiments for a lot of times, but we're leaning into building some of these platform capabilities, similar to as if we were a product organization or a product team. Um, we had to go build a lot of the capabilities for doing things like domain restricted signup. We had to go lean in to make sure that we had systems in place and instrumentation to measure and experiment on things like our uh, emails or and our email templates because those weren't <laughs> by default easy to experiment on. So uh, we had to go spend a lot of time building the infrastructure essentially before we could actually start experimenting. If we talk about 
a classic example, a footer link, something mm -hmm. like built with or whatever. What is the blueprint for tracking the efficiency of this, the performance? Yeah, one, I would think about personalization a little bit more. So to go back into your question, right? Like I can drop a user with a UTM parameter from uh, a link inside of either embedded experience or um, we'll use status page as an example, right? The status page has the link in the bottom. I can click on that, which will then take me as a, as a user to the a particular landing page <laughs> for status page, or it can directly drop me into the signup flow. Um, I can track that using UTM parameters. That is one way to do it. But when I think about creating viral loops nowadays, I don't think about just the tracking. I also think about trying to create personalized experiences. So right, that UTM parameter can give me a better sense of where that customer came from, particularly like the, the status page that they actually came from as well. Uh, but what I really want to know is like when they land on that landing page, what is the message that I showed that particular user based off of where they came from as well? So I know uh, for status page, right? Like it could be, I'm providing them like, hey, it looks like you came in from another status page. Are you interested in, you know, learning more or creating uh, an account, right? So you can then personalize based off where the user is coming from versus just lining them in a generic signup flow that all the other customers would go through. And creating that level of personalization definitely has a huge impact long-term uh, on that viral loop. Uh, again, our goal is to try to um, have a consistent message to the entire experience for the user, mm -hmm. as well as try to decrease friction or increase the reward. So we could say like, hey, it looks like you came in from, or hey, it looks like you came in from, uh, we'll use Amplitude status page, because Amplitude has a status page. Uh, we're giving you an offer of 20% off, right? You can then show them an offer to then sign up for a particular account. So there's a lot of different ways that you could sort of incentivize or create that personalized experience based off of the referrer, not just um, kind of kicking users into this generic flow. But yeah, UTM parameters would be the way that most people would measure that. Mm -hmm. So you spent, how many years did you spend at Lassian? Four years? Four years, yeah. And then you went to found uh, iteratively your own product. Uh, were you able to apply those virality principles we, in your own startup? We, yeah, we were. I think a lot of the time it was... Um, you mentioned, right, you want to have a great product experience before you go build a lot of these experiments. We built it from day zero, <laughs> mostly because, like, uh, again, like, I think we knew the benefit of having these types of experiences. So we had public documentation as an example. So, like, when a customer would go into iteratively, they would create their tracking plan and we would generate public docs. So our public docs page had a, you know, powered by iteratively link on there. We would so that, that was one way of getting people back into our product, um, although that was a huge driver of growth. We had the ability for domain restricted signups that improved our virality quite a lot, just because you can say, hey, if you're box.com, as an example of one of our customers, you can add box.com as a domain. Anybody who signs up with box.com then joins your organization versus creating all of these different accounts, essentially, that we then have to go handle from a support perspective. So not only does this just better experience, it also reduces support load at the end of the day. And given the fact that I was support, that was very valuable to me. Um, the other thing that we built in right away was the the notion of kind of sign up through Google, which I think is probably mostly table stakes these days. But for us back in 2019, it definitely wasn't specifically for enterprise B2B software. Um, and that actually helped increase virality as well, because when somebody signed up through Google, we can actually add things like their first name and last name, we can get their profile uh, photo, we can kind of personalize their first time experience, as well as the experience for anybody subsequently who's joining the organization. So um, that was, you know, the context of kind of a inherent viral loop at the end of the day, where is because they signed up through that particular method, we we're able to create a much better experience for everybody else who joined uh, subsequently, because we would enable um, domain restricted sign up because we had access to their domain. It was a validated email because we didn't have to validate their email. <laughs> it was already validated because they signed up through through OAuth. Uh, and at the end of the time, at the end of the day, we had a lot more information about that particular customer than what we would have had if they just signed up the email. Mm -hmm. And one last question for today. 
there is uh, viral loops and viral growth, and then there is product-led growth, the popular mm -hmm. term these days. How do they relate viral, to each so, other? Yeah, when you think about growth, and uh, one of my favorite companies that talks about this and it helps evangelize this process is called, it's a company called Reforge. Um, they're awesome. <laughs> I've learned pretty much all I know uh, about growth and PLG from some of the folks who either contribute or are members of Reforge. Um, virality is part of a PLG motion. It's not all encompassing. So when you think about PLG, you can think of that as like the overall system of building in kind of a product like growth model at your organization. There's a lot of things that go into that beyond just building out kind of growth loops, but growth loops is definitely probably one of my favorite parts of it. Um, but it's just one part, essentially it's one out of probably a dozen pillars about building a, a PLG motion at your organization. Then there's pricing and packaging, mm -hmm. there's like uh, incentive structures, there's a sales motion, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of other things that you can talk about within PLG that uh, aren't uh, part of virality. Free accounts, the freemium model, is mm -hmm. it is it part of the viral strategy or is it PLG pillar? Yeah, there's there's a I think there's a lot of folks, and we have our VP of growth here, uh, Amplitude, uh, um, as well. And I think one of her favorite things is like a free <laughs> freemium is not PLG, which is the context. Like even at Amplitude, or sorry, even at Alassian, like we experimented with free trials for quite some time. But like for 17 years, Amplitude didn't, or sorry, Alassian didn't have a free freemium model. <laughs> um, and that was uh, a long time not to have a freemium model as, a, as an organization. We had free trials, right? So somebody can sign up for seven days, experience the product, and if they decided to convert, great. If they didn't, sorry, like this wasn't for you. Um, you can definitely have a PLG motion without having a freemium product experience. Um, this really comes down to at the end of the time, right? Like what's the incentive structure for customers as well as the organization with iteratively, we had a free, <laughs> we had, we experimented with both free trials as well as a premium model. Um, and, and at the end of the day, like free trials were just tire kickers for us. Like they weren't a huge, uh, part of our growth as a business. We actually did better with kind of more of an enterprise sales motion than we did with kind of a PLG motion. Not to say that I don't love PLG at the end of the day. I think it is probably the my my one thing that I'm very, very passionate about. But yeah, free freemium <laughs> freemium is not PLG. You can definitely have a PLG motion without having a premium experience. Uh there are many great PLG companies that do have freemium experiences as well, but I wouldn't over index on that. Uh, I'd figure out what sales motion works best for your organization and whether or not that is PLG. Then if you say like, great, we want to have a product led growth model. Do I want to have a free trial or a freemium offering? Um, and then you have to figure out what is the ways to upgrade freemium users to your paid plans at the end of the day. Um, and you might decide that that's too much friction. <laughs> or we're spending too much time on support, supporting our freemium offering. Therefore, we should probably just have a free trial, which is where we kind of ended up landing even at iteratively uh, at the end of the day. That is a wonderful full response. Thank you. Um, where can people, yeah, where can people find you and your work online these cool. days? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. It's uh, at Patrick T010. Uh, you can reach out to me at patrick.thompson at amplitude.com if there's any follow-up questions or if there's anything I can do to help. Obviously, happy to support folks and appreciate you inviting me on to uh, the show, Jane. Amazing. Thanks so much for your advice and have a wonderful rest of your week. You too. Bye-bye.